In my opinion, one of the biggest mistakes people tend to make when it comes to addressing a left AIC or right BC pattern is that they only do ground-based exercises and they don't actually integrate resistance training into their routine. It's really important to actually load ourselves so that we can be resilient under stress, so that when we are fatigued, we don't necessarily have to compensate back to where the body is comfortable and where we have been for potentially years or decades. This could be your average gym goer, this could be a runner, this could be a basketball player or a power lifter. Any type of person who works with loads or some sort of task that requires physical fatigue is going to benefit in some way, shape, or form from resistance training as it relates to the left AIC and right BC pattern. I'm going to get into a couple of different things and specific exercises themselves, but first I wanna talk about principles of exercise selection and how that's going to factor in into how we select exercises for this pattern. Let's take two different examples because it's going to be a little bit different depending on who we're talking about. So let's imagine we got a guy named Tom, example A. He's going to be someone who just started lifting weights. So he is not necessarily as experienced when it comes to lifting things that require him to squeeze himself and compress himself. So there's a pro and a con to this. Tom is not going to be able to effectively get into loaded positions and isolate and really own certain positions but he's also not really good at compressing himself and squeezing because he's not very efficient at that quite yet because he lacks that intermuscular coordination. So Tom can probably use a little bit more weight relative to someone else who's been lifting for longer. So he's basically going to be able to get more relative motion with a higher percentage of his one rep max. Now let's take Bob as example B. Bob is pretty jacked, he's pretty yoked, and he does have that coordination and strength to compress himself from side to side and from front to back in order to lift the most amount of weight possible. So he's probably a little bit stiff as a result of that, and he's really good at orienting his body, and he doesn't really have that relative motion. He kind of walks like a refrigerator, but that's because his body has adapted to all of this time that he's spent lifting a lot of heavy weights. But he's going to require relatively less percentage of his one rep max to get this relative motion because he's so used to squeezing himself and lifting really heavy and using whatever strategy he can, which is just orienting his pelvis. And that's usually what you see with these types of people who have been training for a while. So the general idea is the more weight that you lift, the more you're going to compress and you're not going to be getting segments moving on each other rather than segments moving as a whole. In terms of these exercises that we're going to be going after, we really want to achieve segments moving on each other. The scapula doing something and moving and the arm responding to that and working alongside it and also vice versa at the pelvis, these bones moving within each other. And that's going to be the goal. The next thing would be the difference between bilateral and unilateral lifts. Bilateral lifts are lifts that occur on two legs. So your pelvis and rib cage is doing the same thing on both sides of the body at the same point in the lift. And that's going to be great for producing a lot of force, but that's also not going to be very specific to how we are going to move and get that relative motion back. You're not going to be getting necessarily zero relative motion, but you're probably not going to be getting as much as you would in something like a unilateral activity, like a split squat, where you have one leg forward, one leg back. So you're going to be having one side of the pelvis do one thing, the other side of the pelvis is doing the opposite joint action, and that's really good for getting this type of movement back. So keep that in mind when we talk about these exercises. I'm not necessarily suggesting we get rid of bilateral activities, but if your goal is to help improve the movement options that are limited within these patterns, it's definitely something to consider and it's gonna be individual how much you can do and how much unilateral activity you would need. Now let's talk about the general goals of the left AIC and right BC patterns. I have two videos on each of these respectively already but we can talk about at least the general idea. So within a left AIC, we've got a pelvis that's more forward on the left, more rotated back on the right, and it's a little bit higher on the right. And because of that, we need to counter rotate our trunks back to the left here, relatively speaking. So we have a left side that's stuck in external rotation and a right side that's stuck in internal rotation. This right pelvis is an in internal rotation. This right scap is an in internal rotation. This left scap is an external rotation, left pelvis in external rotation with the sacrum bone facing the right side. So the goals would be, we need to be able to shift into the left side 
and we need to be able to turn our pelvis to that side. And we also need to be able to expand this back left rib cage and expand this front right rib cage because then that is going to help take us from a position of here to here and in the pelvis from here to here. And that would be the goal. The goal is to be able to shift from side to side and rotate our trunk as necessary within that. The muscles that we want on the left side are the muscles that are going to help pull us over to the left side. These are going to be muscles more associated with the early and mid stance phases of gait. So that's going to be our hamstrings that attach back here on the pelvis. That's going to be our AD ductors, specifically the ones that are higher within that femur and attach on the pelvis down here. We're also going to want the obliques to help rotate this back along with the deep transverse abs. And we're also going to want a little bit of the anterior glute med fibers, which are more of those front facing fibers. These are muscles that help shift us over to the left. On the right side, we want things that help push us out of the right. So we want more of the mid to late stance phases of gait, specifically that propulsive phase. So we're gonna want the glute max to contract and push us over to the left. We're gonna want more of those posterior glute med fibers. And we're also going to want a little bit of quad on the front to help create that push. So we want more of that forefoot reference on the right and that arch reference. Whereas on the left, we want more of that mid to early foot reference. Let's start with the split squat because I think that does a really good job of illustrating how these phases of gait can be applied to the weight room itself. So if we look at how the shin angle is going to dictate the position of the foot and the pressures within the foot, that's going to be really helpful for us to decide how we want to select the split squat from side to side. So the more negative my shin angle is or behind the foot, then that's going to be more of an early stance. And then as I go more vertical, it's mid. As I go more positive, it's going to be more late stance or propulsive or pushing. The other thing to take into account is how a load is going to help dictate where we shift our weight. So if I have my left foot forward and I hold a weight in my opposite hand, which would be my right side, we naturally turn away from load. So if I have a weight here and I'm going to go down into a split squat, I'm naturally going to want to shift to the left because this weight is my right hand. I'm going to want to turn away from that, which would be into my left side. If I had a weight in my left hand, that would want me to turn away from it. So that would be more of a pelvis turn to the right side relative to the other one. And that's something we can keep into account alongside that shin angle. So if we wanted to get a little bit more of that early to mid stance on the left, a front foot elevated split squat will be really helpful because that's going to start us in more of this negative shin angle, take us to more of this vertical shin angle. And then we can also add a contralateral load and a forward hip shift. A forward hip shift is going to create more of a bias towards turning this pelvis to the left. And that'll also help us recruit our AD ductor, glute med and oblique on that side as well. And that's a really good way to get us to shift into the left with more of that rear foot reference. On the right side, therefore, a rear foot elevated split squat with an ipsilateral load would be a great choice because that is going to increase the shin angle on the right side, which is more propulsive in nature. So we're gonna be getting more of that mid to late stance to help us push back over to the left. And we're also going to be getting more of that forefoot or arch reference on that side as well. This will help us feel that glute max, those hip AB ductors like the posterior glute med, as well as the quads working on that right side to push us left. So those would be two really good variations, but you might be thinking, well, should I do both on both sides? And the answer is that an asymmetrical body requires an asymmetrical approach. That doesn't mean every single exercise variation in your program has to be unilateral and asymmetrical from side to side forever. It just means that if your goals are to restore the movement options, this will help you optimize that process as you help regain a little bit more neutrality as your program progresses. Now let's talk about a staggered stance deadlift variation. And I'm partial to these for this goal because when you have both feet on the ground, you're gonna be getting more of this relative motion as opposed to having one leg off of the ground, then you're gonna be moving through more of this orientation of the pelvis. So within these single leg deadlift variations, I would pick a staggered stance deadlift with a right foot forward, left foot back, 
and the left heel elevated because that's going to be biasing a lot more heel reference and that's going to be getting us more of that negative to vertical shin angle. And that'll also allow us to shift into that left side easier, especially with that contralateral load. On the right side, something like a kickstand hinge with the right leg forward and an ipsilateral load will help us keep that pelvis turned to the left. And it'll also help us get a little bit more of that glute max and also those hip AB ductors like that posterior glute med. If you're looking for full walkthroughs, demos, and common mistakes on all these exercises, check out the article I'm writing alongside this. It's in the description below. It has all of the exercises I'm discussing here. I'm just not going through each one extensively for the purposes of keeping this video pretty digestible. Now let's talk about the upper body. There's a couple of things we want to take into account because of this lower right shoulder we see in the right BC pattern. And also because of the scapula position, we've got a little bit more compression on that back left side right here. So when this is down in here, this left scap migrates closer to the spine in external rotation, this right scap migrates further away. So we have more posterior compression on the left side and more anterior compression on this right side. So that's what we wanna go after first. We wanna be able to open up this open up this back here. And we also want to be able to, after that, recruit some of the muscles that'll hold us in a better scapular position from side to side. On the right side, these are gonna be muscles that help bring that right scap into more of this externally rotated and downwardly rotated position. The serratus anterior on the right is really important for this. So right arm reaching activities are going to be great for getting the serratus to work in external rotation to keep the scap on the rib cage. Also, the long head of the triceps, which attaches on this lateral border, and the lower trap fibers are gonna help rotate this scap more down. On the left side, it's going to be really important to get those left abs. Getting these left abs to pull this rib cage down right here is going to be great for getting that posterior expansion. But also, we want to get a little bit of the left serratus following that, so that way we can get a little bit of that reach to reference these ribs coming back. Now there's a principle to think about when it comes to how we are going to get this rib cage expansion, especially on the back side. If you look at what happens when I rotate my trunk to one side or the other, you can see how these spinous processes, these little pointy things on the end of each vertebrae are going to turn in the opposite direction. So for example, if I turn my trunk left, these orient now to the right. And if my scapula can be moved away from the spine a little bit in a specific position, which I'll show you in a second, we can open up the space right here for that posterior expansion. We can do that with something that is going to reach our elbow forward while we turn into it. That can be something like a preacher curl variation. We can also use something like an offset push-up because with an offset push-up, if I were to elevate my left hand, my right arm would be reaching further forward, which is going to, again, do this. What we can do on the right side to get a little bit of that serratus and a little bit more of that tricep is to do more of the staggered stance, high to low cable press, where the left side is back within the pelvis itself, right side is forward, and we are trying to reach that right arm forward as we press and that'll help us shift into that left side. So we got a little bit of pelvis and thorax action going on with this type of an exercise. And I will show you this one. This is the high to low cable press with an ipsilateral or same side load. The purpose of this activity is to use that load to help create a turn towards the backside hip within our pelvis. So to set up for this activity, we want a pretty light weight on the cable to start. And we want that cable pretty high, about as high as it can probably go. And on this cable machine, that's about in line with his head, but we don't want it so low so that we're pressing forward. We wanna be able to press slightly down on an angle here. So in this staggered stance right here, he's got his front toes in line with his front foot midfoot. And what this is going to allow him to do is create the pressure in the foot that we want in order to create that turn. So what I want you to do, Trevor, is feel the ball of your big toe, the knuckle right here, not the real big toe, but right here, push down with that, 
and then the inner edge of your heel. That's going to create a little bit of pronation and pushing into the ground with that arch so that he can create a turn into this back side right here. So he's got some weight pushing down right here, about 50% of his weight. The other 50% is back on this left heel right here, but both feet stay relatively flat. It's not like he's picking his toes up on the left. It's just that most of that weight is in that back left heel. Now, Trevor, what I want you to do is maintaining that foot pressure. I want you to reach both arms forward first. This is gonna help him get his stack so that his ribs are over his hips. And he's gonna do a very slight hip tuck, very, very slight, good. Now what I want you to do is I want you to inhale, pull that cable back, exhale, keep pushing through that right foot and staying on the left heel and reach forward as that other arm comes back. Good, just like that. He's maintaining that pelvic position, not spinning out of it. And as he exhales and reaches, he should feel himself create a little bit more turn to the left, but his hips are staying relatively square. He's just gonna feel that momentum push him to the left and rotate his trunk that way. Notice how the foot pressures in that video were cued and how I was cueing more of a right push and a left heel reference. That's going to allow us to, within our pelvis, stay shifted back to the left with the right side forward. And that pressing action is going to help us turn left as well. On the right side, we could do something as simple as a triceps kickback activity because that's going to allow us to recruit a little bit of the low trap, but also a lot of this long head of the triceps to help us pull this scap down and back. But also, that's going to help open up that right chest wall right here. Now, in reality, I'm just kind of scratching the surface here. There are so many different ways you can do this, but hopefully this gets your brain churning a little bit so you can see how we can start to load these positions effectively. We don't have to use a ton of weight if weight training isn't your thing, but if it is your thing, then you can progressively work up and up with higher weights, and then you can start to really load these positions. And for some people, that's really all they need to manage these imbalances. Other people are going to need more ground-based work, and that is also perfectly acceptable to start with so long as the end goal would be something upright and integrative. If you want to see how these exercises fit into the grand scheme of an entire program or just within the context of a single workout, check out my biomechanics program where there's an offline version and a live version. Signups for the live one occur every three months and the offline one is there indefinitely for you. This is going to incorporate a lot of the principles we talked about within this video itself, but expand so much more on it with dozens of more examples.